सो हेलो एवरी वन दिस इज डॉक्टर विनीत सहगल एंड वेलकम टू द इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सेशन थ्री इन इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सेशन वन एंड सेशन टू वी टॉक अबाउट सम इम्पॉर्टेंट इमेज दैट आर देयर इन द आईलेट दैट आर देयर इन द ऑर्बिट एंड वी ऑल्सो टॉक अबाउट द इम्पॉर्टेंट इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन लाइक एप्लेशन टोनोमेट्री कोनियोस्कोपी एंड द फंडस इमेज इन ग्लोकोमा टूडे इन द इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन सेशन आई वुड बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द इम्पॉर्टेंट images that can be asked and what are the relevant clinical scenarios in cornea you can see all my lectures exclusively on the unacademy app if you want to go with the plus subscription which have the added advantage of the daily life classes structured schedule live test and the unlimited access you can go with the plus subscription with my code that is octal10 you can also go with the iconic subscription with it you would have the additional advantage of the prep letter also in the prep letter you would get a video lectures question bank 2.0 and the rapid revision course there is a limited time offer also where you would be getting the iconic subscription in never to see rates which is just 58500 for a 3 year subscription if you want a 1 year subscription that is also having a lots of discounts with just 40500 you can have the total package of the unacademy with the prep letter also if you want to go with a 3 month subscription you would have a 1 month extra free of cost there are lot of batch courses which are going on two important batch courses for the neat neat pg aspirants and the fmg aspirants are the neat pg season 1 batch as well as the fmg test and analysis batch also you can see 34000 plus questions which are specifically designed for the pg entrance exam on the unacademy learning app You can download the Unacademy app from the iStore Store and Play Store. Use my code of Thel10 to unlock the free platform and also use it for getting a discount. With this, I will be starting my session. That is the image-based questions in the cornea and the conjunctiva. So first of all, I would be showing you a picture of the eyeball. So in this picture, if you can see this area, okay, this is basically called a palpebral conjunctiva okay and this yell this whitish area this is sclera so if this is my sclera it is covered by my conjunctiva okay so remember a sclera is covered by the conjunctiva but then we have the cornea so this area which you are seeing this is a transparent structure which is cornea remember the conjunctiva does not basically cover the cornea okay so bulbar conjunctiva is there on the sclera but it is not covering the conjunctiva sorry it is not covering the cornea junction of the bulbar conjunctiva and the sclera and the cornea is this junction is called limbus okay so this is this area which you are seeing this is called limbus so these are the most important anatomical landmarks of the anterior segment on this basis we would be having a discussion of our further slides so this is my first slide in this slide if you can see there is a hazy type of cornea and you can see there is a opacity here i have just marked it this is a opacity so on the basis of how deep is the opacity we classify into nebular macular and leucomatous opacity this is a leucomatous opacity you would ask me sir what is the leucomatous opacity so if this is your cornea okay and if the opacity is basically covering more than half of the stroma remember the stroma is the thickest layer of cornea if it is covering more than half of the stroma then this is a leucomatous opacity from just a clinical picture how you can say that this is a leucomatous opacity so if this is a leucomatous opacity you would not be able to see the iris which is underneath so here you can see there is an iris color seen but in this area you cannot see the iris which is underneath so this is definitely a leucomatous corneal opacity remember in a nebular corneal opacity there is just a nebular haze over the cornea you can see the iris details inside okay in the macular dystrophy also you can have a faint idea about the iris but in the leucomatous opacity you cannot see a iris 
leukomatous opacity this is more commonly when there is a trauma to the eye or if there is a let's say a perforated corneal ulcer in that case also when it heals it heals with the fibrosis and you can have a leukomatous corneal opacity there so this is a band shaped keratopathy if you can see this whitish opacity this whitish opacity in the center of the cornea which is basically a horizontal opacity this is called band shaped keratopathy and why this occurs because of the deposition of calcium hydroxyapatite crystals in the bowman's membrane so just beneath the epithelium we have the bowman's membrane and the calcium hydroxyapatite crystals which are basically deposited can cause this opacity why there is a band shaped keratopathy so i have discussed a lot about the band shaped keratopathy in numero you know in ophthalmology series you can go back to the cornea section and see its causes but just giving you a brief about this bsk the band shaped keratopathy that any condition of the eyeball which can basically attract the calcium crystals deposition can cause a band shaped keratopathy now where it can happen let's say there is a chronic uveitis okay there is a end stage eye disease like a atrophic bulbi like a thysis bulbi and if there is a post retinal detachment surgery if you have done a vitro retinal surgery and you have put a silicon oil in the vitreous cavity sometimes a part of the silicon oil comes anteriorly also and then it can also attract the calcium deposition so these are some causes the some ocular causes of band shaped keratopathy you can also get a band shaped keratopathy in some systemic causes as well like sarcoidosis chronic renal failure hypercalcemia so any condition which can basically cause increase in the calcium level in the body that can also cause a band shaped keratopathy what is the treatment of band shaped keratopathy you have to just scrap the epithelium above and then you have to put a edta solution what edta solution does is it basically chelates the calcium crystal so that can be a treatment option for band shaped keratopathy if it is not resolving then what you can do is you can just do a superficial excision of the cornea also we call it phototherapeutic keratectomy also if it is much deeper then you can go with a lamellar transplant also so these are some important points that you have to remember regarding a band shaped keratopathy then this is the next clinical picture in this clinical picture you can see there is a opacity in the center of cornea and these popcorn type opacities you are not seeing any vascularization you are not seeing any inflammation here so this central opacity which is usually bilateral and they are not associated with any inflammation or vascularization they are telling you about a corneal dystrophy so that is the difference between a corneal dystrophy and a opacity a usual opacity which is there after a corneal ulcer or after trauma it has signs of inflammation a dystrophy does not have any sign of inflammation the second thing which is important regarding the dystrophy is that it does not have any vascularization so these popcorn like opacities which you are seeing this is basically seen in the granular dystrophy one thing that you can appreciate in this picture is that the distance between the two opacities okay that is clear so this means that this patient would definitely have blurring of vision but the vision would not be very bad maybe it's 6 9 6 12 vision but if a patient of macular dystrophy comes to you there would be a total haze of the cornea in the center and then there are few more dense opacities so what i want to say tell you that they can give you a picture and ask you the vision is 6 by 9 what is your diagnosis your diagnosis would be granular dystrophy if they basically give you a similar type of appearance and there is a ground ground glass appearance of whole of the central cornea with nothing clear area and the vision is let's say 1 by 60 finger counting close to face then your answer would be more going towards the diagnosis of macular dystrophy okay then this is also an important image so many times asked this is basically a teresium so if you can see here this area this is a fold of conjunctiva which is basically covering the or which is encroaching the cornea so this is basically a 
vascular ingrowth which is basically impinging the cornea and covering it this is called pterygium remember whenever there is a pterygium this is basically a collagenous degeneration this degeneration has caused the conjunctiva to go upwards towards the cornea what it causes is it can basically pull the cornea and cause astigmatism so sometimes they ask what is the most common cause of decrease in vision in a patient of pterygium so your answer is not a corneal opacity yes it is causing a corneal opacity but as you can see the pupil is not involved so unless the pupil is wholly involved the patient is not having difficulty in vision but he may have blurring of vision because of the pull of the cornea by this pterygium which can cause a astigmatism so i write it here the most common cause of decrease in vision in the patient of pterygium is astigmatism you can see this is the head the body and the tail of pterygium okay so then this is the next clinical picture where you can see fine branches over the cornea okay this is basically called pseudo dendritic ulcer i also call it seen in herpes zoster ophthalmicus okay so what is the difference between a pseudo dendritic ulcer so you can see fine branches fine pattern like here and multiple pattern like here this is called pseudo dendritic ulcer when you have a dendritic ulcer it is more of a larger one and you have the terminal bulbs these terminal bulbs basically harbor the virus cells this is called dendritic ulcer so do not confuse a dendritic ulcer with a pseudo dendritic ulcer the dendritic ulcer is seen in herpes simplex keratitis and the pseudo dendritic ulcer is seen in herpes zoster ophthalmicus okay then this there is a clinical picture of penetrating keratoplasty being done you can see this is the donor cornea okay so this is the donor cornea and donor cornea is basically attached to the host cornea so sometimes students ask me sir that whole cornea is removed so no the whole cornea is not removed of the host the central opacified part is basically removed and we put a near clear cornea here and we basically put the 10-0 monofilament nylon sutures to anchor it okay so if you can see these are the non absorbable 10-0 monofilament nylon sutures which are basically used to attach or hold the donor cornea with the host cornea okay then this is a picture of a patient let's say they ask what is the ophthalmic manifestation that you can get in this patient so first of all this patient is having lots of crusts which you can see here only one side of the face is involved this patient is suffering from herpes zoster and as i told you herpes zoster you can have pseudo dendritic ulcer okay remember this herpes zoster can basically affect in each and every part of that not only just it can involve the cornea and cause pseudo dendritic ulcer it can basically cause iritis it can cause retinitis it can cause the damage to the optic nerve so every area of the eyeball is basically affected with the herpes zoster they can sometimes ask which area is most resistant to the infection so the most resistant to the infection the area or the wall of the eyeball is clear okay then this is a clinical picture of arcus senilis if you can see in this picture just in the peripheral cornea you can see a whitish opacity so this whitish opacity which you are seeing let's say this this image is of 65 year old patient so this whitish opacity that you are seeing this is basically a lipid deposition okay and this is called arcus senilis and if you can appreciate there is a peripheral involvement the central involvement is not there so vision is normal so remember whenever your visual axis which involves the pupil that is normal you would not have a difficulty in vision this is a corneal degeneration do not confuse a dystrophy with a degeneration the dystrophy that i showed you is a corneal dystrophy a granular dystrophy it is affecting the center of the cornea 
the arcus senilis which is a lipid deposition which is there in the periphery it is not affecting your center of the cornea also it is not a opacity per se after a inflammation because it is having no vascularization this is arcus senilis then sometimes they can ask you about this investigation what is this investigation done so if you can see some hexagonal squares hexagonal structures which are here these hexagonal structures are basically telling you about the endothelial count remember the endothelium of the cornea is its most vital structure why the endothelium is most vital structure because these are the powerhouse or the kitchen of the cell they have the all the uh, um, anion and cation pumps and also they are make the eyeball the cornea as a dehydrated structure so the transparency of cornea is basically there because of the endothelium so if the endothelium is deranged let's say after a uveitis or with age or after a intraocular surgery or after a endothelial dystrophy like a fuchs dystrophy or congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy then this specular microscopy can tell you what is the specular count or what is the endothelial count so not only it tells you about the quantitative analysis it also tell you about the qualitative analysis so how many cells are of their perfect shape how many cells are not of the perfect shape this can also be told by the specular microscopy and then this is a procedure of lasik going on so remember lasik that is the laser assisted in situ keratomyelosis where what you do is you change the shape of the cornea you make it more steep or more flat so that the refractive error is basically taken care of this is a lasik surgery okay lasik surgery is of many types now earlier it was the conventional lasik surgery where we used to take a micro keratom blade and used to cut the corneal flap and then use the excimer laser now to cut the corneal flap we have also the femto laser okay so that is called eye lasik there is a conventional lasik which is cutting the cornea the flap of the cornea with the help of a blade a steel blade we call it micro keratom now we have the eye lasik where we cut the flap also with the help of a femto laser then there is another type of lasik which does not basically involve also the flap you just have to make a incision in the cornea and remove a lenticule that is called small incision lenticular extraction so you can see more about the lasik in my numero uno in ophthalmology series where you can get if you just type dr vineet sahgal and you type the specific name of the topic that you want so you just write dr vineet sahgal rop dr vineet sahgal keratoconus so you would get the lecture details and the link you can see the link and also you can get whatever you want so you do not need to see the whole lecture in the let's crack neat pg channel in the ophthalmology list you can basically see the playlist also you can see whatever you want so that is how the pg preparation goes do not see each and everything see what you want okay then this is a patient where you can see the desmond membrane folds if you can appreciate these stria in the cornea so this corneal edema you are seeing the cornea is having a more edematous structure and the dm folds this can happen even after any intraocular surgery so any intraocular surgery can have the desmond membrane folds and also remember that any intraocular surgery what it can causes it can cause decrease in the endothelial count so if the endothelial count goes beyond certain limit let's say less than 1500 mm then there can be a corneal decompensation okay then this is the next picture where you are seeing the cyst in the conjunctiva so this is called inclusion cyst the conjunctival cyst can be of many types sometimes it is just serous fluid based which is called inclusion cyst sometimes it can be because of certain microorganisms some certain parasites also so you can have a cyst because of cysticercosis you can have cyst because of dyrophilaria and sometimes you can have the cyst because of caterpillar hair also so they can show you a picture and say that the caterpillar hair has caused this formation what it is called so remember the name then the answer is ophthalmia nodosa something which looks like a pingicula okay chalo let's move to the next question 
So next question is the image you are seeing. Let's say a 20 year old female came to the OPD with the redness of the eye. So with this, the patient is not having any watering or inflammation, but she is having a picture like this. So this is a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So subconjunctival hemorrhage, basically it can be post-traumatic, it can be idiopathic, it can be post any intraocular surgery or the patients who are on, let's say, aspirin or warfarin or hypertensive patient. The only thing which you have to remember is you do not need to treat the patients. It resolves on itself. Okay, resolves on itself and there is no pain diminution of vision in these patients. This is basically a picture of subconjunctival hemorrhage. Okay, then you can have some pictures like this where you are seeing in the cornea and opacities like this. If you can appreciate in the picture, these are the sub epithelial opacities. Okay, and these are called vortex keratopathy, whole keratopathy or cornea verticillata. So some conditions like Febreze disease or the drug deposits like my favorite amiodarone, phenothiazine, endomethacin and chloroquine, they can cause a cornea verticillata. Like your other degenerations, cornea verticillata is also a reversible condition and it also does not have any effect on the vision. Only thing is when you are seeing the cornea verticillata, you need to know that there may be a drug toxicity and you have to tell the physician to, if possible, can he decrease the drug dose or can he stop the medication. Okay, then this is also a condition which is called conjunctival melanosis. So if you can see around the cornea, this black patch, so this is a melanin pigmentation around the conjunctiva. It is usually harmless, but you need to basically see that if it is not increasing and if it increases, then you have to basically thought, think about if there is no tumor or something fishy that is going inside. Okay. Then they can give you a picture like this. Now, see, this picture is not of a pingicula or pterygium because it is not basically affecting the cornea. Say, see, the cornea is clear here. It is just outside the cornea. So this can be a patient of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So remember, whenever we talk about the ocular surface squamous neoplasia, the final diagnosis has to be done after doing a biopsy. But definitely, this is not a pterygium. This is not a pingicula. Remember, pingicula is slightly aware patch of the dryness that is a patch of a nodule which is just away from the corneal limbus. This structure which you are seeing in all uh, elevated lesion, it is basically being supplied by the feeder vessels. Also, if you can see here, there are arborizing vessels, flower shaped vessels. So this can be a potential patient of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. But yes, definitely a, a a pingicula, a inflamed pingicula or a flectanular conjunctivitis, a flectanular nodular episcleritis can also look like this. So finally, what you have to do is you have to remove the uh, this, this nodule and send it for biopsy. And if you see the keratin pearls or the squamous neoplasia cells, then your diagnosis is confirmed. So they can give you a question like this, that this is the picture and the patient is responding to the topical mitomycin C therapy. So this is also an indication that patient is suffering from OSSF. Okay, then this is a patient who is having a microcornea. So whenever we talk about the microcornea, microcornea means there is a small cornea and small eyeball. So you just remember it with the mnemonic MSS. So small cornea and small eyeball. Do not confuse it with nanophthalmos. In nanophthalmos, you may be having the uh, small eyeball, but your Cornea is normal and your lens is normal. Okay, then this is a patient who is having a failed corneal transplant. You can see that this area, this is the, this is the host, this is the host cornea and this is the donor cornea. You can see the host cornea is also getting a corneal haze and you can see the vascularization there also in the host cornea. So a vascularization of the host cornea, this is a very, very important sign of a failing corneal transplant. So the hazy cornea and new vascularization of the cornea, they are basically telling you that this is a failed corneal transplant. Okay, then this is a picture of a intracorneal ring segment. Okay, I call it intex, which is basically used in a progressive keratoconus. So these intakes are made up of polymethyl methacrylate 
not only they can help in the progressive keratoconus they can decrease the total refractive power of the patient also so those patients who have very high uh, very high amount of the keratoconus and these patients also are having a, a problem in their uh, in their uh, progression they are progressing a lot these patients are having a very good relief with the help of these intracorneal ring segments which are called intex so thank you very much for attending the session hope you would have liked the session we would be having few more sessions of the image based of questions in ophthalmology thank you very much subscribe for the channel let's crack knee pg if you have any doubts you can ask me on the telegram app thank you and jai hind